Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Metri. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa. Namo Tassa. Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Welcome to Pali Night. Um, actually, I, I started I started that off in the way that a Pali Theravada teacher starts off any uh, Dharma talk. Um, much as in the Mahayana world, we give that. Um, Gata on the opening of the of the suttas or opening of the dharma sharing of the dharma it's a similar thing the way they um give honor to the buddha at the beginning of any of any talk so what i want to talk about tonight and what i'm going to title this talk is but i'm not good enough for enlightenment and i think a lot of people come to the dharma with just that feeling Enlightenment's great, but I'm not good enough for the enlightenment. And so I want to pick a, uh, uh, the I want to take the opportunity tonight to talk about three different individuals, kind of going from not so bad to maybe a little bad to horrible, and yet all of them gained their enlightenment. And these are all stories from the the Pali Canon. Um, thus I was jokingly calling it Pali night, uh, cause they're all from this Theravada tradition. We're going to start with the Dhammapada, um, and a story that comes from a verse in the Dhammapada. Um, and so the first one is, um, uh, from the Dhammapada in verse 270. And it says by harming living beings, not one, oh, by harming living beings, one is not a noble man. By lack of harm to all that live, one is called a noble one. And so the story behind this, this phrase or this, um, this stanza from the Dhammapada is a story of a fisherman named Arya. And so in Pali and also in, in uh, the Sanskrit Prakrit languages, Arya was the word that they used for the noble people. So the noble ones, meaning the followers of the Buddha, those were that were members of the Sangha, uh, those who had taken on the noble life, the holy life. And so there was once a fisherman who lived not very far from the north gate of Sawati, uh, where the Buddha was often staying in a lot of his sermons that he gave. And one day through the Buddha's ability of insight, the Buddha found that the time was right to go and talk to a fisherman and to allow him to attain the first stage of enlightenment or stream entry. And so on his return from alms round, the Buddha went and the monks from his local monastery that he was hanging out with at the time, they followed him. And he stopped near a place where there was a fisherman who was fishing. And the fisherman's name was Arya, which means noble one, right? And so when the fisherman saw the Buddha, he threw his gear away. He threw his gear to the side and came and stood near the Buddha. And, um, and then he began to ask the names of the monks who were standing around him. Hey, what's your name? Oh, my name is Ananda. Oh, what's your name? My name is um, uh, Mahanama, whatever. You know, he was asking the names of all the monks that were standing around him. And then he asked Arya, he says, well, what's your name? And the fisherman said, my name is Arya. And the Buddha said, Aryas do not harm living beings. But since the fisherman was taking the life of fish every time, the Buddha said, you're not worthy of your own name. And at the end of the discourse, 
the fisherman threw away all of his gear and left behind what he did for a living, took on a new job, and he attained stream entry, that first step of enlightenment. So here was a man. We know when we talk about the eight noble, um, the eightfold path. Um, one of those in there is right livelihood, and the Buddha was using this as an example that a job which takes the life of living beings is not in, is not in conformance with the noble eightfold path. And he knew that Arya was ready to hear that story. He knew that Arya was ready to be challenged on what's your name? Are you really a noble one? And Arya decided from that point forward, I will be a noble one. And he took that threefold refuge, that refuge in the Buddha, the refuge in the Dharma, and the refuge in the Sangha. And at that point, he became a stream enterer. So that's the first person, okay? Not a very bad thing. He just had a wrong livelihood. He was ready and ripe for turning his life around. The next person is a little bit different. The next person is about a man named Sarakani. So there was a man named Sarakani, and there's actually a sutta about Sarakani uh, called the Sarakani Sutta, and it's in the Samyutta Nikaya. And uh, there was a man named Sarakani who died. And when he died, as a lot of people in the community, as, as did happen for a lot of people in the community when they died, the Buddha would tell what their next stage of life was going to be. And he, so it was kind of a well-known thing that uh, when people would die, people would ask the Buddha, well, what's going to happen to, you know, this person after he dies? Or what's going to happen to this person after she dies? Well, after Sarakani died, somebody asked the Buddha, he says, um, I, you know, honored one, world blessed one, whatever the, whatever the correct translation is for how they would address uh, Sakyamuni Buddha, they said, well, what happened to Sarakani the Sakyan? And the Buddha says, he died to be a stream enterer. Seven more times he will not be born before he attains full enlightenment. And the people were astounded. What? What are you talking about? How can Sarakani be a stream enterer? How can Sarakani have entered the first stage of enlightenment? Sarakani's a drunk. He's a freaking alcoholic. How on earth can he become enlightened? How, is, how did he become a stream enterer? And the Buddha used this as an example. He used this as an example to teach the monks. He says, Hey, and there was one monk in particular, and the monk's name was kind of the, um, well, actually, no, he was a lay follower. So there was one lay follower who uh, was kind of the big doubter and asking questions, kind of conveying the messages from the people. Why, why did the Buddha say this about Sarakani? So anyway, there was this lay follower named Mahanama who had long ago taken refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so he was a, a devout lay follower. And so the boot, and so he was conveying the messages of all these people who just thought, oh my goodness, all right, now we know the Buddha's off his rocker because he thinks that this drunkard in town uh, is a stream enterer. Again, that stream entry uh, in, in Pali, they use the word sotapani, uh, which is um, the first, a person who enters into the stream or that first level of, of uh, enlightenment. And uh, The Buddha says, well, let me ask you a few questions. He says, tell me about a man. What's going to happen to a man who is endowed with unwavering devotion to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha? He is joyous and swift in his wisdom, one who has gained release. By the destruction of his cankers, he has his own realization and and he lives in it. He's freed from the realm of hungry ghosts. He's freed from all downfall of evil way from the states of woe. And he kind of goes backwards and kind of Buddha kind of starts with, 
let's start with the holiest of holies, right? Let's start with an arahant or in the, in the Mahayana world, we'd say with a, with a great Mahasattva. Let's start with that person. They've cast off all, they, they've devoted their lives to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and they've cast off all their fetters, their earthly fetters. What's going to happen to them? Well, of course, you know, they've attained, they've attained this great state of enlightenment. So then what happens to the next person? You know, that is really good, but maybe not quite that good. You know, oh, well, okay, they, they attain the, the state of non-returner. That's, that's the third stage in the, in the levels if you, if you question. So there's, anyway, short story. There's the stream enterer, there's the once returner, there's the non-returner, and then there's the arahant, or, you know, we kind of use the bodhisattva ideal in Mahayanas. Um, so the Buddha kept asking these questions and finally got down to what is it? that qualifies someone as a stream enterer? What is it that qualifies someone to be on this path towards enlightenment, that they will not be born again into the realms of the animal world or the, or the hungry ghost or into the realms of hell, that they will attain enlightenment within their next seven lives? And the Buddha taught them. They said, he, he told them, he said, the key is, all the things that this Sarakani had done. Yeah, he wasn't very wise because he kept drinking and it affected his, his wisdom. But what did he do that was right? And the Buddha says, what did he do? He was fully, fully devoted to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. He said, he fed us. He took care of us. He was regularly coming to learn the Dhamma from, from the monks, and, and he had devoted his life to supporting the Sangha. And he said, so I take someone who may be foolish in one way, but is wise in understanding the noble, the Four Noble Truths. He's wise in understanding the devotion to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. That makes him a stream, a stream winner. That makes him a stream enterer. And so as the Buddha used these examples to explain that, the people were kind of like, I guess you're right. And they kind of came to understand what it takes that even somebody who's not perfect can gain enlightenment. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to try. That was the key. And now we get to the worst of all, Angulimala, the great murderer. I think you've all heard the story of Angulimala. Angulimala was really, he was a well-renowned murderer. Um, you probably heard me tell the story a little bit before, but Angulimala is the Pali term for a necklace or a garland made out of fingers. So a mala, we, I think we've all heard the, the phrase mala before. That's more or less a necklace or a garland. And Anguli means fingers. So this murdering bandit would chop off the fingers of his victims and make a necklace out of them and wear them around in order to bring fear to more and more people. Uh, and he was, he was known in the sutta, there's a sutta uh, called the Angulimala Sutta, and it's all about him. And so anyway, this, that's in the, the middle length discourses of the Angulimala. And I really encourage you to read it sometime if you really want to see this idea of developing from from absolute baseness to absolute enlightenment it's really a great story of redemption in the dharma so angulimala was this great murder and he lived kind of along this valley and uh there was a trail that would go through the valley and unless you were you know the king's army and coming with 500 men nobody would dare go through that valley uh, and the and the story was that that Angulimala would kill up to forty people if they were to, even there was a band of forty people coming down that path they would kill him he would kill them and and cut off their fingers and put add their fingers to his necklace anyway to make a very long story short uh, one day the Buddha woke up and said you know what Angulimala is ready I'm going to go down that path and the Buddha woke up put on his robe and started walking towards the path that went through this little valley. And uh, everybody was like, stop, master, stop. You can't go down that road. There's this horrible guy named Angulimala. And, uh, and he says, you know what? I'm going. Now's the time for me to talk to Angulimala. And he took off down the trail. 
And sure enough, lo- and and none of his none of his monks would have come with him. They all were like, "I'm not going down that path. Not only is going to kill me and take my fingers." And the Buddha took off, and he went down the path. And uh, not long after he's going down the path that goes through this valley, he hears this voice, "Hey, monk, stop!" And the Buddha keeps going, and the and the sutta, in kind of its typical Pali fashion of of talking about the Buddha's supernatural powers, it says the Buddha the Buddha using his supernatural powers. Um, created a situation where Angulimala would never be able to catch up with the Buddha no, how, no matter how fast he ran. And so the Buddha kept walking and Angulimala was running as fast as he could and he couldn't catch up with the Buddha and he kept yelling, stop, monk, stop. At which point the Buddha says, I have stopped. And he says, you haven't stopped? And he says, I have stopped. And he says, monk, you said you've stopped. But when I have stopped, I say you haven't. I ask you the meaning of this. How have you stopped and I haven't? And then the Buddha says, I have stopped on Lumala once and for all, having cast off all violence toward all living beings. You, though, are unrestrained towards beings. That's how I've stopped and you haven't. To which Angulimala says, at, at long last, a great revered great seer for my sake has come to the great forest, having heard your voice in line with the Dhamma, I will go about having abandoned evil. And so at that point, Angulimala, something snapped. He immediately became a stream winner and said, I will follow you. This, you're the person that I've been waiting for to come and teach me the truth of the Dhamma. And so he did. And the Buddha then answered to him and he said, Come, Bhikkhu. And immediately that was considered to be, when the Buddha called him a Bhikkhu, that was considered to be his ordination into the order. And not long after, his monks come following up behind, and the monk, and he says to, uh, I think it was to Shariputra, if I remember, I, I don't remember exactly, but he says to his monks, he says, Guys, here's Angulimala. He is now a member of our Sangha. Help him shave his head help him shave his beard and we're going to put him in a robe and he's going to come and join us and he did and they did all that on the way back to their camp they get back to the camp and the king is there and the king had gathered up 500 horsemen and they had come they were on the war path to go catch this Angulimala and the Buddha says where are you going king and he says we're going to go catch this horrible bandit named Angulimala and the Buddha says what would you do if I told you that Angulimala had changed his life what would you do if I told you that Angulimala had taken on the noble life, had shaved his head, shaved his beard, put on a robe, and come and joined us with the Sangha? The king thought about it for a while, and he says, I guess I would bow down to him and thank him and, uh, and treat him the way we treat the rest of your monks, um, as followers of you and those who have entered into the holy life. And he says, King. This is Angulimala. And the king asked him, he says, Angulim- you're, are you really Angulimala? He says, if you're Angulimala, what's, what's your father's name? And he says, uh, I can't remember. I think his, name, his father's name was Gag- Gaga, I think. Let me look real quickly. He says, my father's name was Gaga. And he says, well, what was your mother's name? And he said, um, Mantani. And he says, then Master Gaga Mantani Putta, meaning son of Mantani, Mantani Putta. Then, then, then Master Gaga Mantani Putta, delight in staying here. I will be responsible for your robes, alms food, lodgings, and medicinal requ- requisites for curing illness. And from that point forward, Angulimala entered the holy life. And the story goes that Angulimala eventually found his own liberation uh, and own full enlightenment. Um, so here we go from someone who just needed to change their livelihood. They were doing a good job. They just didn't have the right livelihood that the Buddha was talking about in the Noble Eightfold Path. He changed his life and he gained a a sense of enlightenment. He gained that first step of enlightenment. When I say, but I'm not good enough for enlightenment, Arya probably didn't think he was either. And boom, he found it. And then there was the drunkard, right? Oh my goodness, I'm sure that Sarkhani didn't think that he was good enough for enlightenment. 
And yet he devoted his life to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And at the end of his life, he found his enlightenment. And then the horrible, horrible murderer, Angulimala, who murdered, I, who knows how many people. The, the, the sutta says, you know, that he just, he murdered, uh, and let me see if it even says, it says he murdered so many people that he would just, he turned villages into non-villages, towns into non-towns. Um, uh, he settled countryside into unsettled countryside, having repeatedly killed human beings. So he, he was well known as being this, this horrible murderer. And here, he attained his own enlightenment. But I'm not good enough for enlightenment. You know what? You are good enough in light, for enlightenment. The Dharma is here for all of us. And all of us can attain this enlightenment but we have to find it inside. No matter how bad you've lived a life, no matter how hard you think things have been for you, the Dharma is still there for you. And the Buddha testifies that to us in his suttas time after time after time. So if you ever think, I can't keep my precepts, it's not a, it's not a sentence, sentence to hell. Oh, but I'm not good enough to do this. You can find it. The Dharma can change you. Thank you.